So we finally get an opportunity to have a look front to rear at the Bloodhound car. Thousand miles an hour at peak speed that we're expecting when it finally does its runs in South Africa. Obviously way above supersonic. Uh, Thruster SSC did that several years ago, but still we have to remember this car is going incredibly fast. The aerodynamics, supersonic. So we start at the nose tip, as you can see, it's not completely finished. There's a little aluminium uh, end to go on there, but you need such a long nose in order to be able to get the shock wave away from the rest of the car because of the supersonic speeds. So most of this front structure here is really just storage uh, and aerodynamic. There's no real functions to what goes on inside there. And then we start to come to the, the real nuts and bolts and carbon fiber as it is of the car. Now, Bloodhound is a kind of Jekyll and Hyde car. You've got half race car, half aircraft in construction. So at the front, you have a carbon fiber monocoque. It's probably the biggest carbon fiber monocoque that's ever been produced for a car, much bigger than a Formula One car or a GT or a LMP1 car. Andy Green's cockpit deep inside here. Tiny little aero screen. Uh, Formula One drivers were very interested in the construction of that. Inside, uh, the control is very much like a car. Pedals and uh, uh, not a steering wheel, but a, a yoke. 3D printed in titanium. Really impressive little piece of work. And then we come to some of the mechanics at the front. Again, this is where the race car element comes in. Uh, you have uh, pushrod suspension all mounted to this aluminium bulkhead, which they call the goat's head. Uh, I saw that machine, huge single piece of aluminium working here. So you have conventional double wishbones, pushrod steering. Now, at the moment, the car's running rubber tyres. That's just for the uh, tests here on the airfield. Once they get out to the desert, once they get out to the plains, they'll be all aluminium wheels, much narrower, with a slight bevel to them, so they actually rise up out of the sand at high speed. Because they're running these rubber tyres, they can't actually fit the rest of the aerodynamic bodywork. These tyres are too big. Uh, we can't probably see quite here, but around the back you've got Formula One-like carbon fibre discs, huge AP brakes to help bring the car down to speed. Then, as we sort of step back, we now come to uh, some of the powertrain. The tanks on the side here, these aren't actually holding fuel or anything. These are actually just holding cold water, which is there to cool the engine uh, inside here. This is a Jaguar supercharged engine, which is purely there to act as a pump, and it's pumping the oxidizer into the solid fuel rockets at the back. So it's running at extreme speed. They have these water tanks so they don't have to feed air into a radiator. Obviously at the top, You've got the inlet for the jet engine, jet engine coming out of a uh, Typhoon uh, fighter. Obviously the Typhoon has two, this just has one. This just helps it get up to speed before the rocket's engaged and that takes you up to that final thousand mile an hour top speed. At this point here, we're breaking away from the carbon fiber monocoque and we're now going much more into aircraft construction. As you can see here, aluminium ribs, with the titanium skin. And a couple of years ago, I was actually at the factory watching these being done. And time served, RAF engineers drilling each of these holes, countersinking them, deburring them, putting Clecos back in, finally riveting them. This has been an absolute labor of love for the engineers and the apprentices that have been helping out along the way. You have, um, you can see through here, more of the aluminium structure and then the mounts which are holding the uh, jet engine and the rocket engine into the, uh, the chassis come along the back. This big blank area here is for the air brakes. Uh, again, the car has brakes, it will have parachutes, but it also has air brakes to bring it down from the thousand miles an hour and to bring it down to that final stop before they turn it around, go for the second run in order to get the world record. As we step right towards the back, again, you can see the aircraft heritage here, tail fin. Now we can see a little spindle sticking out there. This is for uh, a tailplane. Now, at high speed, obviously this car has got huge amounts of loads on it. It's about a seven and a half ton vehicle. But at the high speed, although you've got suspension, it's passive suspension, it's just springs and dampers, there's nothing active in it. So to keep the car stable, you actually have active aerodynamics, which will just balance the car, trim the car out to make sure that the wheels aren't being loaded too much. Forces at the wheel about two and a half tons at a thousand miles an hour. Now they can play about with that and they just make sure the car stays planted. They don't want the car to sit too heavily on the wheels, equally they're not with the car to lift, which at that speed obviously would be an absolute uh, catastrophe. And then as we come to the very sort of back, anyone that looks at racing cars will recognize here, you've actually got a pull rod suspension system, double wishbones, dampers, all very, almost Formula One like at the back of the car with the aluminium structure. And then the real business end of Bloodhound at the back here, you have the outlet for the jet, obviously afterburner, huge amounts of thrust. And then down here, uh, not yet fitted will be the three solid uh, fuel 
uh, rockets, which will fire. And that's, as I say, that's the thing that gives its final uh, jolt up to a thousand miles an hour. And at this point, you really can see the mix between aircraft and car. You've got conventional suspension, a rocket and a jet. Absolutely amazing technology, all completed uh, in the UK down at Bristol.